instructor here at Galvanize in the Data Science Immersive, which is our three-month course to get people with existing technical skills trained as data scientists specifically. Um, you can find me in all of those places. Twitter, I'm, a, I'm pretty bad at using all of them, so don't expect much. Uh, the requirements for this talk, technically, you should be able to get by if you just have SK Learn. Um, I encourage you to try to follow along as we go. Um, I'm going to show a link to GitHub where you can clone this repository. If you want to increase the degree of dif difficulty uh, by not cloning that repository now, it should be possible to do the examples that we're going to do based just on what I show you without having access to the solutions. But if you clone the repository and you just want to coast along and see all the solutions in advance, uh, you're welcome to do that. In addition to this technical requirement, I'm going to assume that you have passing familiarity with the API of sklearn. If you don't, it's totally possible that this talk will be the talk that convinces you to try sklearn. Uh, and that you know it won't turn you off to it, but I think it's best if you have heard of it before. And in particular, the API to sklearn is quite elegant and beautiful, and we're going to take advantage of that. And so you might appreciate this a little more if you kind of appreciate that fact already. All right. So as promised, here is the GitHub repo. Clone or don't clone, as you see fit. OK, so here's my high-level plan for the day. We're going to talk about pipelines and feature unions. So these are what I consider to be at least among the best parts of sklearn. So if you came here expecting to learn like the latest new model implementation or unsupervised method that's been added to sklearn, that's not going to happen. This is all sort of meta material for making use of, of all of those things. So whatever you know about sklearn, if you're not currently using pipelines and feature unions, I guarantee that adding those to your workflow will make you a, a better, more effective data scientist. And so that's kind of why I think of them as the best part, is because we don't have to learn any more technical material. We can just take ourselves, make our efficacy as data scientists better. And I think actually in sort of profound ways. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And that might get us into why you should care. Uh, we'll get, we're going to do some actual hands-on examples of how they work. It's not super complicated, although I will warn you that you know once you get out of the context of this talk and you increase the complexity of things that you try to accomplish, there's a few um, pitfalls. Hopefully, I can warn you about some of them, but uh, there are probably some that I don't even know about yet. Um, we're going to write custom transformers, which is a pretty critical step in like really implementing these tools into your workflow. And then we'll get one sort of larger, more realistic, open-ended example where we're going to use heterogeneous data sources and construct our design matrix uh, from a variety of data types. And I think that, that at that point, it should be really clear exactly what the power of these um, classes is. And then I'll, I'll try to point out some of the weaknesses and forthcoming features. I spent a lot of time in preparing for this talk, digging through the issues on GitHub on, in the sklearn repository that discuss kind of like future directions for these two classes. And truthfully, I'm not sure they're going to resolve some of them. <laughs> they seem to be a little, at a little bit of an impasse in some regards. So we'll talk about those things. Um, and particularly if some of those commonly requested features that they're stuck on, uh, you know, at least you'll know, hey, don't hold your breath. <laughs> you may have to like work around. It's not, they're not big issues though. OK, so pipelines and feature unions. How many of you have ever used these things before? A few. OK, so it's pretty simple, really. It's a method for chaining multiple estimators into a single estimator. And so an example of an estimator in scikit-learn is uh, linear regression. It has a fit and a transform method. Almost everything in sklearn has a fit and a transform method. And we're going to, cr we're going to chain multiple such estimators into a single one. And that final estimator is going to similarly have all of the properties of the estimators that it's composed of, namely fit and transform, 
if it's a if the final step of that estimator is a classifier, it will have all of the methods associated with a classifier. If it's a regression method, similarly, it will have all the methods associated with that. Um, so sometimes when I when I talk about object-oriented programming, I talk about how object-orientedness is a little bit of a weird fit for data science. It's natural to think of a data science workflow as a series of transformative steps. And that kind of workflow maps really nicely into functional programming. So if you've ever used dplyr, where you're chaining together all of these steps and like passing the output of one into the other, that is a purely functional kind of workflow. And it's really wonderful. Um, SKLearn, on the other hand, is completely object-oriented. And so when you start chaining together many steps, if you're not using these, uh, these abstractions, it gets pretty hairy. You can write like kind of confusing and gnarly code. And so actually pipelines are kind of the solution to that hairiness. It, 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 it's still fully object oriented, but it allows us to get that sort of chaining behavior uh, from all of those sklearn objects that we know and love. So um, the, the common estimators that we think of are, are models in sklearn, but there's a bunch of other ones that are like just the practical ones that I think of as being sort of especially useful as working data scientists. So those are things like standard scaler if you need to scale your variables, or one hot encoder if you have categorical features, that kind of thing. So um, all of those things are fair game here. Uh, pipelines, so pipeline is going to chain those things together in series, and feature union will chain them together in parallel. So I think of feature union as a way of constructing multiple columns for our final design matrix, possibly in parallel. Um, and then all of the pipeline steps are things that have to happen in order. Uh, and they go together, and they can actually be sort of arbitrarily nested. If there's one weakness here, it's that sometimes the real life workflow that we need to implement gets pretty deeply nested. and the resulting sort of uh, instantiation of these pipeline objects can get pretty big and intimidating pretty quickly. If you're really particular like I am about maintaining your line lengths and your code and that kind of thing, <laughs> you may have to pull out a lot of tricks to, uh, to make that work in this case. Okay, so uh, we're gonna use both pipelines and feature unions separately and then uh, ultimately together. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm calling this the best part of sklearn, and that's, you know, better than even the supervised learning, unsupervised learning, model selection and evaluation, and it's going to augment all of these things and make us a little bit better at all of these tasks, so that's, that's pretty cool. So why are they so great? I talked a little bit about how they kind of make, get us into this sort of sequential, like functional style thing with, while still allowing us to use the object-orientedness of sklearn. Um, they also encourage some other good habits. And these are, it's really nice actually. You spend, you don't realize how much time you're spending worrying about making some of the, these mistakes that uh, pipelines can actually make it really easy to avoid. Uh, including cross-validation. So it's really going to like separate the concern of cross-validation from the actual computation of our data. Um, and if you've, ever, if you've ever done a workflow, and I'll, I'll cop to this, where you tried to do all of your feature engineering on the original data set and then separate it into a cross-validation set sort of after all of those transformations, you may have worried about target leakage and doing some of those transformations. If you do that, it's really possible, depending on what you're doing, to introduce information about the target all over that entire matrix. And so uh, when we do the pipeline and we have a fit and a transform method, the fit method is only going to have access to the training data. And so it becomes much harder to make those kind of like pernicious and subtle mistakes. It's the kind of thing that no outsider would ever look at your code and say, ah, there was target leakage here. But uh, when you know the, what you're trying to accomplish really deeply, it's possible that you've done that. Um, uh, another sort of pernicious thing that happens when you're doing a complicated real-world modeling task is that you, you, introduce, you take, make a lot of choices uh, in doing these modeling tasks. And sometimes those choices 
become parameters in your model and, and you don't acknowledge it. And so we would, we would never you know, use a regularized regression without doing a little bit of grid search on what the correct value of that hyperparameter is, but we might impute missing values in some column or decide to throw out data in some way. And, and that really amounts to a parameterization that we've introduced into our model that we never test whether our choice that, we, that we're maybe making in, under a deadline or something like that is actually correct. And so a, a really powerful thing about using the pipeline is that it promotes all of those choices and it makes it really easy for you to consider them as sort of first class parameters of your model. And then you can do grid search on them in the same way that you would do grid search on any other parameter in your model. And you know, properly grid searching the parameters of your model is a way to make your model perform better. So this is great. Um, it's also uh, gonna give us some benefits in readability. It's gonna separate the details, like the nitty gritty details of the implementation uh, from the sort of higher level like sequence of steps that we're going to undertake, right? So if we're constructing complicated features, sometimes you don't really wanna look at all of that code in the process of uh, just trying to figure out exactly what a model does, and so it's nice to separate those two things. And then lastly, feature unions give us cheap parallelization for computing some of our features. So this is maybe not a really big concern, but it's at least better than the alternative, right, which is sitting around and waiting for these things to finish serially. Uh, and we don't have to really do anything for it. It's all handled for us, so that's nice. Um, so I mentioned a couple of reasons why I think these will make your models more performant, and I want to show this graph here. Has anybody ever seen this? This is called CRISPDM. It's the output of a European Union effort. <laughs> I think they spent millions of dollars to create this chart, actually, but um, I, I was skeptical when I heard about it, but uh, after having looked at it for a little while, I actually find it pretty uncontroversial. This is like meant to describe the process of doing a, a DM in their acronym stands for data mining, so that tells you what era it's from, but this is their cross-industry standard practice for data mining, CRISPDM, and this is supposed to describe how you would uh, do a sort of data mining and, or what we would now call data science task, and it begins with business understanding, which is supposed to inform data understanding. In fact, those things inform one another, and then you go to data preparation, modeling, uh, evaluation and deployment. So that, that pretty much describes the process of, say, building a data product. I don't think anybody would find any part of that controversial. Um, but there's this sort of cyclic uh, outside ring here that describes the fact that ultimately you're going to do, go around this cycle many, many times. And I would assert that going around the cycle many, many times is the best way to get better models rather than progressing through those steps with the most deliberation possible. Now you may disagree with that, maybe you have a different way of working, but I think that getting a basic model working and then iterating quickly, I'm not alone in that, I've definitely heard that uh, basic principle espoused a lot. Uh, I think that that's the most effective way to get really good performing models. And so pipelines are gonna allow us to do that more effectively. And so that's like a kind of high level reason why we might expect using this type of technology to ultimately make our uh, data science process as a whole more effective. And in particular, the data preparation, modeling, and evaluation steps are going to be greatly eased um, relative to not using some, something like this. Okay, so how do they work? It's pretty simple. We're gonna initialize a pipeline with a list of tuples, and those tuples are going to contain a name for that step of the pipeline and an estimator. There's a shortcut that doesn't require us to specify a name, but I find it kind of nice to provide my own names for these things, so um, I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, all of those things that you provide in that list have to implement a transform method and also a fit method. And calling fit on the pipeline is the same as calling fit on each estimator in sequence. It transforms the input and then passes it on to the next step. So that has some consequences that we'll see for how we have to design these things. Um, all, all of the estimators in sklearn are already going to work with this, but when you write our own, we have to be a little bit careful. And 
I mentioned that the pipeline has all the behavior that the last estimator in the pipeline has. So if it's a classifier or, or a regression model, then it can do all of those tasks. And if it doesn't have to be the case that the last step has a predict method, but in practice, it usually does. OK, so here's how it actually works in code. Uh, we, we import from the pipeline module the pipeline object. Here I'm going to import additionally two other estimators, uh, just so we can talk about, see how we would chain those things together. I mentioned initializing a list of tuples, or initializing this thing with a list of tuples, so I'm, I'm defining that list as estimators here. And then uh, the convention that I see most often in the docs is to call the pipeline, or uh, in this case, we're, we're building a classifier, so they, they often call it CLF for classifier. And then when we inspect that object, you kind of can see uh, it tells us what the steps of our pipeline are, and then it gives us all the details about those various steps, right? So it's, it's doing the, this is the repr method, I'm sure, when you call PCA or on SVM. And you can see, we, we see all of the arguments that are available to us in those two estimators. And in fact, we're going to be able to use all of those or set all of those parameters here in our pipeline. We don't have to specify them up front, so I haven't done that. Um, this gets to the point about uh, the, the, pipe, the pipeline having all of the properties of its last step. So in our case, the last step here is a support vector classifier. It has a predict prob a, predict log prob a, predict method, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things that we might expect to find on SVC are, are now exposed to us as part of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, all, so when I talk about parameters, I'm, I'm thinking of the parameters of every estimator in the entire pipeline. And so we'll see an example of that, actually, maybe in the next slide. So um, the, yeah, so this is it. So if we were going to do grid search with this pipeline, we can use our normal grid search CV functionality here. We pass that our estimator, which in our case is the pipeline, and then we, we pass that a param grid of things that we want to search. Now, uh, when we use the pipeline class, we get this sort of altered naming convention for the parameters. So we specified the name of our parameters, or the names of our estimators in that list of tuples. So I called the PCA step reduce dim. Uh, and then I can access the, the parameters of that estimator by using the name, double underscore, and then the name of the argument that I want to specify. So then I could grid search a bunch of different values for that PCA, and I can grid search you know, all of those steps in my uh, SVC as well. So in this case, I'm just, just grid searching a couple of uh, parameters for sort of argument's sake. Um, but then it really works just like the, the normal grid search. It turns out that as we nest our estimators together too, so I mentioned that you may combine feature unions and pipelines and those could actually be nested, that you would just chain together the names and separate them with double underscores and you get access you know, arbitrarily deep into that pipeline no matter how complicated it is. All right, so any questions about that? Great. So it, sklearn has a lot of transformers, and you may have looked at some of those th things before and, and thought to yourself, what, what good is this? Like, why would I use the sklearn standard scalar transformer? That seems like a kludgy interface for doing a pretty simple task. Uh, and once you have the pipeline, then it becomes really obvious why you would want to use that, um, because it fits into that, uh, it, it implements the API that's required for using in the pipeline. Uh, so there are a lot of transformers, and you'll probably find yourself looking at the docs in a totally different way when you're planning on using all of those things in a, in a pipeline. Uh, it, will, it will really 
open your eyes to some of the things that they've implemented that might otherwise seem sort of dull or routine. Uh, but oftentimes you still need to write your own. And I don't think this is really well covered in the docs, so um, I am going to propose here a recommended signature for your custom transformers that I think you should probably start out with. And um, if you don't start out with it, you are quite likely to run into a couple of mistakes or just a couple of um, head scratching errors. And if you use this signature, then you won't encounter those errors. That's not to say that this doesn't have other possible unintended consequences, but you'll see this uh, is used quite a bit in sklearn source. And I think it's a it's generally what you need for at least for simple transformers. So uh, the first point here is that when you create your own transformer, you should inherit from two classes in base, transformer mixin and base estimator. You could, of course, like wrap those up into some other single class that you want to inherit from later um, if you were getting tired of typing those two things over and over again. Um, but I, those two things are going to give you some default behavior in your transformer that I think you'll probably want. Uh, transformer mixin gives you fit transform. And that's pretty much all. It doesn't do anything else. It just, it just knows how to call fit and transform together. So why not? I don't want to implement fit transform. I only want to implement the two things separately. So that seems to make sense. Base estimator does a little bit more stuff, but the most important thing that it does is it implements set params and get params. And the implementation of those things is not as straightforward as you might think. Um, but that gives, you grid, that gives you the ability to grid search based on the naming conventions that we saw earlier. So you're probably going to want that in most cases. Um, the, the base estimator is the one that might be most likely to introduce some other constraints that you may not like. And so you may find in the case of base estimator that it's, you don't want to inherit from it and you'll just implement your own set params or get params uh, methods. And so I would say start here until you run into problems and then consider that. Inheriting from base estimator does introduce the constraint that all of the arguments need to be named keyword args. You can imagine why this is the case if you're going to do set params in grid search with those long named arguments. Uh, you're not going to be able to pass in star star kw args, for example. So you can't have any positional args, and all of your all of your args need to be named keywords. So keep that in mind. I think that it raises intelligent errors if you somehow uh, try to do something else. Okay, so you're also going to want to implement a fit method. The fit method takes as uh, arguments x and y. Uh, just like almost every fit method. Y can be optional. You don't necessarily have to do anything with Y, um, but you need to specify at least a place for it because if you provide Y, if one of your transformers needs Y, uh, it will try to pass it into all of them. So whether you make use of it or not, you need to include that argument. Um, and the, the way that this works is that you set state in the fit method that you're going to use later in the transform method. So if you were doing, if you were using standard scalar, right, and we'll, we'll maybe get a chance to re-implement this later, when you do standard scalar, you need to calculate the mean and standard deviation of your data in order to later scale new data. This is a slightly subtle point that comes up. This is one way that people introduce target leakage. If you scale your data before you cross-validate, you have included information from the held out data when you calculate the mean and standard deviation and, and normalize your data. So this is kind of an example of how it forces you to not, inc not incorporate that kind of information leakage across your cross-validation sets. If you only have access to the training data, if you only call fit on the training data, then you'll have to compute those means and standard deviations or whatever other quantities you want to state you want to compute and store here. Uh, only on the training data, and then when you call transform, you'll, you'll apply that data. So that's kind of how I think about it. And you may do nothing in fit. Um, for example, transforming your units from Fahrenheit to Kelvin, you don't need any state about your data to do that. So there, there are a lot of cases where you'll do nothing, but you must return self, because we're going to ultimately chain these things together. And so when you call fit, you have to return self always. If you don't do that, you will, it, it will definitely break your pipeline. So. Uh, that's the last important point about that. 
Um, so then transform is what hap what, where you apply the state that you saved in fit. Notice that transform doesn't get Y. There has been, there's some talk in the issues about whether there should be transformers that, that take Y. And I don't think that they're going to add this functionality anytime soon. There are some cases that come up where you might want to transform your Y. Um, I used to work on pricing models in, uh, in, in the auto space. And in that case, we actually did quite a bit of transformation on our Y. And so I can sympathize with the people who want this. But it seems, it seems like they haven't yet figured out a sort of generalizable way to allow people to transform their Y variables. And it, it comes with the, the downside that like they could misuse that Y in the transform step to do some kind of horrible target leakage type of thing. So I, I don't think that's forthcoming. But uh, if you find yourself wanting that, know that you're not alone. Uh, and then uh, for transform, we don't return self. We return the actual transform data, whatever that is. Any questions about this signature? It's pretty straightforward. OK, so I'm going to give you guys a few minutes, uh, and I'll be available to ask que answer questions. If you want to follow along here to uh, re-implement this standard scalar, uh, so I just described it, but there's also sort of some mathematical notation here that should help you remember what it does. The idea is we want to take our feature and remove the mean and scale it to unit variance. So np.mean, np.std are the two functions. Those are NumPy functions that you would need to uh, implement this. If you call your transformer, if you want to clone this repository and not look ahead at the answer, you could call it myscaler and save it in scalar.py. And there are some unit tests for your benefit that you could try to uh, pass in testscalar.py. And if you are not familiar with that magic, you can write your scalar in the notebook and, and then use write file. The write file cell magic will create that file for you, and then you could run those tests for, for right from within the notebook as well. So I will set a timer here. Maybe I'll default to five minutes. That's probably too short. But if I get questions, then we'll just extend that. All right, going, going, gone. All right. OK, so here is what I wrote for that um, problem. Uh, and I, I think that this is consistent with what I recommended earlier. We inherit from transformer mixin and base estimator. Then I just calculate the mean and scale. I save those to, as state on my scalar class. I don't even have to specify an init method here um, because there's no parameters for this transformer. Uh, and then I just, uh, at transform time, I, I copy the data, subtract it, subtract the mean, and, and divide by the scale. Oh, man. <laughs> this is a thing, this is a big problem that sklearn has. <laughs> sklearn is trying to play nice with everything, including pandas and numpy and like a couple of other strange ways of representing this type of data. And I think that honestly, this is why they're maybe a little bit stuck in terms of some of the features that they might like to implement in pipeline is that they're trying to accommodate all of these use cases. So they do accommodate them at least minimally. But for example, so there is a package called pandas sklearn. And it purports to solve some of these problems and let you use pandas objects. Um, but as soon as, you as soon as you start passing these pandas objects around, like oftentimes they pretty quickly get converted into other types of objects. And so you'll be writing your fit method as if it was going to have a a uh, pandas object, and suddenly it's giving you an error because it's been converted to an ND array. So it, <laughs> it is a problem. It probably, you can make it work, but it's not fun. This, that's one thing that I don't enjoy about this whole process.
Okay, and so actually that is a good leading question for this point here, which is that uh, the feature union is going to call fit and transform in parallel. So it's really doing a very similar thing to the pipeline, except it does them, op optionally does them in parallel. Uh, but then it takes the output of all of the things in the feature union and np.h stacks the outputs together. Now they don't describe it, they, they would talk about it concatenating, concatenating the things together, but what happens under the hood is np.h stack gets called. And so you have to, it's useful to be aware of that because if you're dealing with an object that, if you're expecting to deal with an object that um, doesn't play well with np.h stack or if you do some nested uh, complicated pipelines, if you have a feature union, if you pass pandas objects into the feature union, it may work. np.h stack will work on pandas series, for example, but what comes out of np.h stack called on pandas series is not another pandas data type. So uh, then you're, you've lost some of the richness of the pandas objects, and that can be quite um, challenging sometimes. So that's really all feature union does. Uh, I think I spent a little time looking at this uh, when I first encountered it, trying to figure out if there was something more to it. Uh, there's really not. The only other thing that there is to it is this transformer weights argument, which becomes a parameter that you can grid search. And transformer weights is a, a, takes a list of scalars th the same length as the feature union and specifies um, like a multiplicative scalar on the output of those feature union things. So why would we want to do that? Um, I think that the answer is that in cases where you are doing regularized regression, for example, that are sensitive to the scale, everybody will tell you, you must scale your data before you run your regularized regression. But what they don't talk about is that we don't know what the optimal scale is for our particular problem. We accept that it should probably be scaled, and typically we do like a, a standard scaling. But it's possible that some alternative scaling would actually yield better results. And so transformer weights allows you to explore that possibility. You could actually you know, make the scale of one of your variables twice that of the others, and you may get a better performance out of your model by doing that. Um, and, and that is particularly true in regularized settings. So um, I guess support vector machines also have a little bit of regularization, so those and, and regularized regression. Um, but, but if you have a lot of variables, it's still gonna be a lot of things to, to <laughs> grid search, so I'm not sure how practical it is to, to do a lot of grid search of those things, but at least it's better to, be, to know that you have not grid searched something than to just claim to be at the best case scenario. Uh, then the last thing is number of jobs which you can use to get parallel computation. So by default, this is set to one. You don't get the parallelization uh, right out of the box, but all you have to do is set this argument to get parallel computation. Um, one problem with this is alignment. So if you're accustomed to using pandas, you're gonna be really frustrated because np.h stack doesn't respect any of our indexes on the pandas objects. And so if you do certain types of complicated transformations and you change, say, the order of the rows in your input data, suddenly, alignment, your alignment may be broken. So this is, I, I don't have a good solution to this except to be careful. Um, maybe it would be involve something like, you know, doing a little sorting inside your uh, transform method to ensure that what comes out uh, is ordered in the same way as the original. Uh, the last caveat here, and this is, this is, the problem that the package I mentioned earlier, pandas sklearn, is purportedly attempting to solve. Uh, and, and you'll see other various hacks to solve this problem as you dig into this, is that oftentimes you have a big X matrix and you wanna call your feature transformer on just one or a small subset of your columns. And in order to specify that you want your transformer to only be applied to a particular column, the current state of the art is to make a pipeline that has two steps, the transformer that you want to call, and before that, a like stupid selector transformer that just pulls out the column you want and passes it on to the next transformer. This is so kludgy, and it makes an already bad problem, which is that your pipelines can get kind of verbose and large, 
even worse because it adds us another step to every single st transformer in your feature union. I looked. At, I tried to look and see, you know, if they were going to resolve this soon. It doesn't really look like the answer is yes. It's kind of a. They're a little bit up against the wall in terms of the API, um, and there's just no elegant solutions. It's another area where trying to support all kinds of input data types causes them difficulty. So I'm not optimistic that this will get better anytime soon, but uh, currently that's the way it is. There are examples of doing this right in the documentation, so at least it's easy to find the, the hacky solution. <clears throat> okay, so here's how this feature union would work. Um, we're gonna take our example here to be a list of text data. Uh, so we'll call that our corpus of three short strings. Uh, and then we can call this feature union. Again, we initialize the feature union object with a list of tuples, that is the name and the transformer, so just like a pipeline. Uh, and then uh, I probably should have broken this last line into two parts, so the important thing to note here is that I'm calling fit transform on my corpus, and then all the rest of that line is, is just there to make it display well. When you're dealing with text data, uh, sklearn by default uh, uses sparse matrices and stuff which don't print out well. So I'm creating a dense matrix and then slapping it into a data frame to get good formatting, but none of that stuff is necessary if you're using sklearn. Um, so uh, we just call fit transform and this is, if I, if I scroll over to the, the far right here, the last column of that is the output of our word counter. So we get columns for, uh, the, from the tfidf vectorizer and then we get an additional column that is uh, word counts. Turns out word counter is not a transformer in, included in sklearn. I, I implemented that. If you clone the repo, it's in there. Oh, tfidf vectorizer is a uh, sort of NLP transformer. So it's taking the, it stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. So it's, it's counting up the sort of, uh, it's, it's a measure of the, um, unusualness of a term. Let's put it too short. Uh, but it's often a way of just like creating sensible features from, the, from text data. Okay, so we have another uh, opportunity here to practice. So um, if you wanna take a few minutes to try and write your own feature union that takes a single vector as input and then returns three columns corresponding to the square root transformation, the identity, and then the square transformation. This is like a, the kind of thing that you might do um, in a, the context of a linear regression or something like that. Um, and a, as a hint, you can make this really easy if you use this function transformer, which is a convenience a uh, wrapper from pre-processing that allows you to just take a basic, if all you want to do is transform your data according to some function and you don't need to store any state about it, all you have to do is pass in as an argument to function transformer, the function that you want applied in the transform step, and then it will make it into the sort of fit transform type of, uh, it will conform it to that API in a way that we could use it right away. And as another hint, if you pass none, as the argument to that function transformer, it will do the identity transformation, which is one of the transformations we're trying to do here. <clears throat> okay. So here's how I accomplish this. Uh, using the function transformer, you can just pass in good old NumPy functions and get the transformer um, API from them. So. Uh, just a few lines here, really. And uh, that seems to be working. I didn't try it with the matrix, though. In general, uh, your issue about what, like, what, what are these columns that get returned from this thing is another thing that vexes the pipeline a little bit. There are, there is a way to, there's a method called get feature names, but it's, it's a little bit problematic because not every transformer returns preserves things names, right? So if you do PCA, like what should we call that? They, they don't seem to have a good solution for that, but you, you may be able to answer those types of questions for yourself in a, in a complicated way with get, get feature names.
Okay, so um, you get a little bit of efficiency when you use feature union in that you can compute these things in parallel. But if you're doing a huge grid search operation, it's going to call fit transform on those steps with probably identical values a lot of times, right? Like it'll be changing the parameters of some other fit transform and calling repeatedly the fit transform method of uh, an upstream, say, step in your pipeline repeatedly. And so you, there might be caching that could help with this. That would be a big, I would expect that to yield big performance increases if you can skip an entire fit transform um, because we've done it before. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, so that's something that I think is doable and there are people working on it. So, uh, but it's not implemented now. So, you know. You, you, grid searching takes a lot of compute time, but hopefully you can go just take a nap while it's happening. Uh, you can also in, implement inverse transforms. So a lot of the um, methods, a lot of the estimators that you will use already have these methods implemented. So I think if it's possible to do it, uh, they all have it. Uh, and you can implement it too, and then you could do inverse transform uh, on your pipeline, which is, gets kind of hard to think about, honestly. Uh, and then post-processing and transformations of Y. This is sort of related to uh, the issue that I mentioned earlier about transforming your Y variable. If you want to do it or if you want to do some post-processing thing, you just probably have to do that on your own now. It doesn't look like that's going to be uh, forthcoming anytime soon. Okay, so uh, the last thing that we have here to do is I, in the GitHub repo, there is some actual real horrible data. Um, and this comes from a Kaggle competition called Blue Book for Bulldozers. And so this is transaction data for bulldozers. And it has all kinds of uh, data types. And uh, in general, making like complete use of all of the information in this thing would probably take a long time. So I'm not going to suggest that you do that unless you're just a glutton for punishment. But um, this is sort of what the data looks like. Uh, tons of missing values, uh, and I think this is really where uh, the pipeline can shine because you can be very deliberate about, oh, how am I going to impute these missing values? How am I going to um, compute the various features here? Uh, and so um, here are some suggested things that you might try to attempt with this data. Uh, there's a column called usage band, which is like, I think, ordinal in some way, high, medium, low. Uh, you can use the sklearn preprocessing one hot preprocessing dot one hot encoder uh, transformer pretty much directly on that. Uh, careful using one hot encoder if you're trying to fit an unregularized linear model. It actually includes, um, it introduces some collinearities. So um, they, <laughs> actually in looking at that, I, I, I looked at the sklearn uh, folks, like some people were complaining about this collinearity, and the sklearn people are such diehard machine learning types that they just don't seem to care. <laughs> They're like, what, what's the problem? Why, why does it matter? And people are like, well, it's linear regression, and you, you guys offer that. And they're like, well, just regularize it. <laughs> so I, I like that answer. If you, if you, <laughs> if you don't want to do that, you probably, if you don't, if you're not a machine learning person like that, or if you're not doing machine learning, you probably want to be using stats models for that reason. Um, uh, you could do count vectorizer on the product class descriptions. That's a little bit of text data. Uh, one hot encoding would work possibly for state, although that's already getting kind of a, a 50 classes there is like pretty uh, questionable perhaps. Um, and then you could also com compute a custom transformer to compute the age at sale. So all of your feature engineering can be wrapped up in transformers, and it's actually a nice modularization of your feature transforming. It's like one step goes in a single transformer, and that's pretty nice if you've been writing kind of like long scripts where it's hard to say where one feature starts and the other one uh, begin, well, where one ends and the other one begins. Uh, having them all wrapped up inside their own transformer classes uh, will be pretty luxurious. Um, and then 
as a very difficult challenge, there is you could create a custom transformer that takes the, the most recent sales in one direction because we don't want to use information from the future here. Uh, so we might take the K most recent sales within a model ID and try to compute an average price of those sales. That is likely to be a very effective uh, uh, feature in this type of model, but it's quite difficult and, and you're gonna to compute that both in general It's kind of delicate to do it in pandas um, And then using those pandas methods from within the context of your custom transformer is also a Slightly delicate question. So uh, those are some suggested if you want to challenge yourself and try to plug all these things together this will almost certainly take a nested feature union pipeline um, to, to accomplish these things. I'm happy to answer any questions about how you might uh, get through that. Um, but that's pretty much, I think I'm, I've done quite a lot of justice to the pipeline here. There's not much to it. Uh, if you feel like I've missed anything, I would love to, to extend my knowledge, but um, I think the rest of it is just sort of practical implementation details. So I'm happy to answer questions or help out with this uh, uh, hairy task. Um, the last slide here is I mentioned this item selector, which is sometimes required to select a particular column for use in a feature union step. Here is the item selector that uh, is used in the sklearn docs. Um, it's very simple, but uh, for some reason still necessary. And as a, you can see that the data that they assume in this case is actually a dictionary of lists. And uh, so that is another example of the sort of heterogeneous data types that they support in the use of this pipeline functionality. Yeah, so debugging these pipelines is definitely um, can get can get quite difficult, especially when you have a, a complicated pipeline. So I would definitely recommend that. If you have small steps that you can break out, um, the pipelines are sort of recursive in that sense that they just are chaining together all these calls to arbitrary depths. And so if you can take out each piece and make sure that it works and build up the depth that way, I think that that makes tons of sense. I don't think that there's any other way to do it. I mean, besides entering the debugger and just like trying to slog through it, but that's, uh, that's not gonna be pretty. Yeah. Would love to hear anybody else's best practices that they've encountered. That's a, that's a good one. All right, thanks everyone. I'll stick around here for a few minutes and answer any questions or try to debug your pipelines. I should not make that offer, but uh, I'm happy to take a look at anything you have.